Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle, the film and media channel focused on all things 90s and 2000s. This week, Seb and Ollie will be discussing Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle. Today we're looking at an actual movie that did something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to watch um, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Movies don't do things. They're an entirely passive art form. What? <laughs> Movies don't do things. They're media. I, I don't know. Um, you know, you could throw a um, film reel at somebody who's chasing you. You know, slow them down. Yeah, but that's you using... A, uh, uh, okay, that joke didn't land. Let's not do it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, we are today watching Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And yes, we are British and we're going to keep calling it that. To Americans, it's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone because apparently Americans don't know what a philosopher is. You know, that, this is how high the film industry holds you in esteem. Well, the book was called The Sorcerer's Stone in America too. So, and I don't know why, because they didn't change any of the other titles. No, I, I think they did a few localization things, like they changed sofa to couch and things like that. Yeah, I mean, localization always happens, doesn't oh, it? Oh yeah, so. that, that, that's minor. I mean, four kids are terrible for it, because you've got things <laughs> like um, <laughs> changing um, rice buns into um, donuts and stuff like yeah. that, haven't you? And, and pastries. And pointlessly changing names. We, he can't be called Janochi because the American kids won't like it, have got to call him Joey, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I, I kind of get that, and also I unironically love the four kids dub of Yu-Gi-Oh, so maybe you're <laughs> talking to the wrong person. Yeah, I think that um, you're a bit um, nostalgia-blinded there by... It's just... How good no, was I've the thing? I've watched some Japanese Yu-Gi-Oh lately, I've had nothing better to do, okay. and it's just not as charming. No, well, <laughs> it's basically Saw, but with a um, Egyptian pharaoh, isn't it? Yeah. I love... <laughs> In the four kids dub of Yu-Gi-Oh, and I'm, I swear we'll get back onto Harry Potter yeah. after this. That a an ostensibly American teenager shouts a Japanese phrase to turn into an Egyptian pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he doesn't even shout Yu-Gi-Oh in the Japanese version. It <laughs> just goes to show that you know we're all citizens of the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. back onto Harry Potter. Yes, indeed. Oh boy, is this a nostalgia fest. I remember seeing this um, when it came out in the cinema. It was sold out. It was. I don't think it's happened since in the world. It's definitely the last time I remember a film. Well, I, it's the last time I was not able to get into a film because it was sold out. Yeah. And this was in 2001. It's the last time that um, I remember us uh, having difficulties getting tickets to see a movie. You know, the only other time I remember was A Bug's Life. Those were the two movies in my lifetime where there were those difficulties. I mean, that wasn't too far before this, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, a couple of years, I think. Um, Harry Potter was 2001, I think? Yeah, the first it was. One. I-, I remember. Yeah, I remember seeing it with my family. Uh, well, the um, family of who my mum was going out with at the time. I keep saying this like she was some sort of person who went out with loads of people. She didn't. You know, it's just... Anyway, yeah. I remember one of the things I remember distinctly after seeing it was afterwards uh, they were like, "Oh, I hope that wasn't too scary for you. I hope that wasn't too scary." And I was like, "No, no," because the thing they thought I was scared of and that was scary was when Voldemort's face sort of dissolves or Quirrell's face dissolves. That was never scary to me. It always looked false and CGI. You know, it didn't look in the least bit intimidating. And with um, Philosopher's Stone, I actually read the books just beforehand. I was probably partway through Chamber of Secrets by the time I got to this, but I started reading the books specifically so I'd go into the movies knowing what to expect. And the book, the movie was an eye-opener. Until then, I'd be pronouncing Hermione her my own. Yeah. Because I never met anybody called Hermione. I wasn't really a David Bowie fan back in the day, so I didn't know about Letter to Hermione. How about you? You know, did you read the book first or did you watch the movie first? Uh, yes and no. Um, what? In I was in um, primary school at the time, uh, oh, year yeah. six, and the teacher 
had read the Philosopher's Stone to us yeah. and had finished shortly before the release of the film. Yeah. Like, uh, if we were good, she'd read us a chapter of Harry Potter, that sort of thing. Because this was back when Harry Potter books were only a couple hundred pages long and you could finish them in an afternoon. Yeah, I had experienced the story of the book shortly beforehand. Yeah. And I read the end of it. Uh, before that, because I discovered. <laughs> oh, I co- skipped ahead. <laughs> yeah, I discovered a copy of the book. Um, I think my brother owned it or something in my yeah. house. Uh, and we were only at the point I remember when they decided to uh go down the trap door and thwart who they assumed to be Snape. Yeah. At the time, and it's like I found the book. I was like, I'm gonna read ahead and read the end of it. I. Had ex- I won't say I'd read the book first, but I had experienced the story of the book uh, yeah. by the time the film came out. And I had to wait like two weeks to go and see it. So, uh, <laughs> my dad took me to see it the first time. Yeah, um, it was packed when I saw it. You know, there wasn't an empty seat. Yeah, same, same. Crazy. I did not experience that again until the premiere of The Force Awakens. Yeah, like, yeah, but when it's a premiere, you know, people make the effort, you know, when, when you're just yeah. casually going to see a movie, you don't expect to have any problems. I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw a movie, not on a premiere day, or like in the first few days for something like Avengers Endgame, where there were any more than, say, 10, 12 people. Yeah. We live in a small town, keep in mind. Yeah, mine was packed, like, um, I mean, I think it was at least two weeks from release at that point. I mean, two weeks after release. It was so hyped. Because that was the first time I could get in. Do you know what? To this day, and this is going to probably make me unpopular with people, I don't understand why Harry Potter was such a huge runaway success at the time. Well, um... I liked it, and I liked the movies, and I was into it at the time, but I don't understand what made it so much higher than everything else at the time. I just don't get it. It was something that a lot of people happened to... Uh, read and talk about, I guess. And it just yeah. sort of must have just snowballed. I don't know if it speaks to any of the particular cultural touchstones of the time. Uh, I think we're going to have to... I might research that. Yeah, because, you know, it doesn't really do much about mogul culture. You know, it's sort of in its own culture, so it's not really like you yeah. could say it's something of its time. I mean, the best I could really say about it is it's basically British Naruto. <laughs> You know, you've got the three kids, they're in the school, they're learning the skills to go out and fight. You know, they've got this weird, old, creepy guy who's trying to come back and, you know, uh, trying to take advantage of various situations. With a snake motif. Yeah, with a snake motif, yeah. It's like a Rochamara who was basically Voldemort bin Laden. (laughs) Very much of his time, actually, as a character. I suppose. Uh, uh, I was going to call it British Star Wars, but yeah, it it was sort of that equivalence, wasn't it? You know, as yeah. as a phenomenon. I mean, like a kid that grows up with his aunt and uncle discovers that he is special and has access to an ever-present energy field that only he of his immediate family can tap into. <laughs> All of that is storytelling one hundred and one. You know, you've got the chosen one trope. You've got. The orphan, because, you know, you've got to go on a sympathy for your main character straight away by making them an orphan. You know, <laughs> Spider-Man, you know, you've got um, uh, so, so many things that do this. I think um, the fact that it's an escape story, like, you know, yeah. Harry escapes from his awful aunt and uncle, uh, is one of the things that makes it as popular as it is. One of them. And I'm not saying that everyone has horrible families that they want to escape from. We at least have family who embarrass us at the very least. Even apart from that, it's just the thought of escaping from your life and finding an exciting new world where everything is special yeah. is pretty much universally appealing. Well, I always find the world building and the law to Harry Potter fascinating, if nothing else. you know. Even I, if it's I always bit... cared more about the world building and law than I did about the characters. So yeah, fantastic the characters... beasts and where to find them was basically exactly what I wanted in Harry yeah. Potter spin-off. Shame about the sequel, isn't it? I know! What happened there? I know. The first one, which was good, and then the second one, which was absolutely dreadful. Oh my god, it was awful. But we're not talking about the crimes of no. Grindelwald right now. <laughs> <laughs> or the crimes of the people who made the crimes of Grindelwald. 
No, those were far more heinous crimes, but, you know. Here is proof to our audience that we can actually dislike movies. Because, yeah. you know, some people are going to be watching this channel thinking, what the hell? This guy says that Harry Potter's overrated, yet he talks about how great Jingle All the Way and Bicentennial Man are. Context, you know, like, yeah. not everything is on the same scale of quality. Yeah, and, and there's time and a place, you know. I I don't know when I'm next going to be in the mood to uh, marathon all the Harry Potter movies. I don't think I'm going to be in the mood to marathon all the Harry Potter movies again, to be honest. No, to be honest, the rewatchable ones for me are Order of the Phoenix and Goblet of Fire. I don't know why. Yeah, uh, I like Philosopher's Stone. My yeah. favourite one is Prisoner of Azkaban. I actually quite yeah. like Chamber of Secrets. I don't know why everyone hates that one. Do they? <laughs> well, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know if hate is the right word, but it, they regard it as the one you can skip, which I get. Like, two important things happen in that movie. Yeah, I mean, you know, it introduces the best fictional character of all time, Colin Creevy. <laughs> Come on, we, we've all known that annoying kid who never knows the t- right you know, time or place, and is always shoving a camera in your face. Well, not necessarily a camera, but they're always a bit tone deaf, and, you know, like, if you've got in a fight or something, they'll try and cheer you up in the worst ways. Yeah, shall we try talking about Philosopher's Stone a bit more? Yeah, as opposed to literally every other Harry Potter movie. Um, perhaps we'll cover the other ones another time. Uh, do you remember liking this? I remember liking it, yeah. I, I really liked the book at the time. Um, yeah. So, I really liked the book at the time, and yep. this was that, but a film. So I was all <laughs> in on that. Yeah, so that's how adaptations work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I was, um, I was exactly the right age to have to have read the first Harry Potter book because I was the same age as Harry at the time. So you know, the films came out at exactly the right time for me on the whole. Here's something that annoyed me. Uh, you know, I, I used to have to, well, I still do, have to wear glasses, and I had to from a very early age. And do you know what? I had people coming up and saying to me as soon as Harry Potter became popular. Uh, yeah, that you look like Harry Potter. Two things. The obligatory, you look like Harry Potter, even though I didn't. You know, I, I looked very different to Daniel Radcliffe at that age. I look different from him now. Uh, and also, you could have been Harry Potter. It's like, You're not that good an actor. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can care. I have to tell my agent to, you know, put her work in next time. You know, I didn't land that um, lucrative Harry Potter role. Yeah, although I do remember, and I apologise for this now that I'm bringing yeah. it up. I do remember when we were eighteen or so, calling you, saying that you looked like twelve-year-old Harry Potter with a mouth full of sweets. Oh, you! <laughs> I, I did say that. At the time. You fool! I said it to you. I would have thought you'd bring it up. <laughs> I forgot about that until you brought it up. Okay, well, now that you remember, I'm sorry for that old wound right. I just reopened. <laughs> now that we've got casual insults out of the way, let's <laughs> watch Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Yes, let's. Okay, so Harry Potter. Yeah, did you like it? Uh, okay, before we say anything else about Harry Potter, I don't know when it was we made the recording in relation to this. It was at least a week ago, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah. In the intervening week, J.K. Rowling has J.K. rowling herself all over Twitter or... Um, well, you you know. The, yeah. The latest, the latest J.K. Rowling. Yeah, but that's reversing. nothing new, is it? You know, it's... And it really, sh- it really should go about saying that none of us agree with her. Yeah, before we say anything else about Harry Potter, uh, can I just say, fuck J.K. Rowling, trans rights are human rights. Yes, uh, yes. Watch Bicentennial Man sometime, you know, you'll learn. Yeah, because that was what that film was about. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could be read that way, I suppose. Well, yeah, well, from one Christopher Columbus movie to another. Yeah, but no, seriously, fuck J.K. Rowling, trans rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, Harry Potter. I did actually enjoy the film. Yeah, yeah. I, I Honestly, when it comes to pure atmosphere, this is the best one for me. Yeah, I um, it's it definitely takes some beating. It's up there. I think one of my favourite uh, shots, uh, I think, is after he's caught the snitch, the oh. the big sort of hero shot, um, 
on the Quidditch pitch with the vibrant colour scheme, the swelling score, and everything just comes oh, together. yes. When you first see the moving staircases, when you first see the castle on the lake, you know, the Great Hall, there's so many moments like that, and I just love it. Everything feels like a screensaver in this movie. A lot of the whimsy just sort of disappears later in the series, doesn't it? Yeah, because I don't remember the name of the guy who comes in to direct the ones after, you know, um, uh, almost a chambermaid of secrets. Chamber of secrets. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Um, Chamber of secrets. Yeah, the guy who comes in to direct um, three through to, well, seven, part two. Uh, he's good. David Yates, that's it. Yeah. Right. He's good, but he's just not. Chris Columbus good. Yeah. Um... But Harry Potter sort of transitions from, you know, a children's book series to a young adult book series. We, the audience, are often put on Harry's level. Uh, right from the beginning, when he first gets out of the cupboard, there's a low angle shot to make the house, it makes the house seem imposing, almost oppressive. And, you know, we're at his height level when he gets out of the cupboard for the first time. Yeah, that's done well. Yeah, and was it an intentional reference to the birds when, you know... I think it's meant to feel ominous, but in a sort of a kid-friendly way, you know, it's very Matilda about it, isn't it? Did Chris Columbus just chuck in an obscure reference for people who would get it? (laughs) Well, that's what all filmmakers do, though, isn't it? You know, it's like, um, you know, the Battleship Potemkin references in The Untouchables... Not that the birds is obscure, but like if you're a kid, you prob- if you're in the intended audience for this movie, you probably haven't seen it. By that very obscure screenwriter, uh, Alfred Hitchcock. It does feel very Chris Columbus. Yeah. <laughs> like, he- he's definitely got uh, a presence, an atmosphere that he makes his own. He makes the world feel big and impressive. He makes the world feel um, joyful. In a way, like especially when uh, you know when it's Christmas. I mean, oh, the yes. Philosopher's Stone more than the others is a good Christmas movie, I think. But is it Iron Man three good? I mean, well, no, no <laughs> you, you don't get better than yeah, Iron Man three. Yeah, yeah, that's the best Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just feels like Christmas when he wakes up and he realizes he got presents. You know, it's the first time that he's been treated yeah. properly by people who care about him and. You know, that joy shows on his face. It's wonderful. Yeah, it was there on this watch through, I noticed that Harry's remarkably well adjusted for a person who has been abused for the first ten years of his life. The problems start when he hits puberty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know it's a, you know, a kid's book slash yeah. film, and I shouldn't read too much into this, but someone with Harry's level of treatment should have no self confidence whatsoever. Yeah, and he's a bit headstrong in this at times. You know, like when he heroically goes after the remembrance. I'm not... Well, I I say he should have no self-confidence whatsoever. I would have found it more believable if he struggled with self-confidence after the abuse. I know what you mean. You're not like him. You know, what's he got to be so smug about? You know, he's not even got parents. (laughs) I'm not dictating how you should respond to (laughs) your trauma. Yeah, that smug (laughs) git... That, that's probably how I would have responded to my trauma, is the whole, you know, being yeah. all quiet. But, you know, it's not like um, Harry didn't get him back, to be fair. Eventually. Well, no, he um, killed him as a baby. He killed Voldemort. Oh, right. I thought you were talking about his aunt and uncle. <gasps> yeah, yeah. Well, it he, he gets to the point where he... He didn't kill them as a baby. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been so much better, like edgy Harry Potter. <laughs> 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 Uh, he mounted their head on the walls <laughs> as a baby. <laughs> but I like how when we were watching this movie, we got to the scenes where he confronts Cruel slash Folds, and we're like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if he got the giant broadsword off the chest piece and sliced him down the middle <laughs> or stabbed him through the chest? <laughs> what? Well, when, when the sword was thrown at his feet, that, you know, when the king piece threw the sword at his feet, in defeat, he does does he not have the right to claim the sword? Yeah. Why didn't he take it? I mean, I doubt he could have lifted it. Look at the size of it. But I mean, if only Harry Potter was written by George R. R. Martin, he would have yeah. used Gorgio and his muscles, gone in there with the massive sword, and split Quirrell down the middle. And <laughs> just impaled him to the mirror. 
what trunks and Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> uh, I would have seen that. Like, as soon as he's got over the surprise of it being Quirrell, just raise the sword and charge. <laughs> But yeah, we both liked it. I mean, I think that Harry Potter in general is overrated, to be honest, like, looking back. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of you are going to hate us for, you know, saying, oh, it's all right, and then saying, oh, my God, Bicentennial Man, it's so amazing, or, you know, oh, my God, Dunstan checks in. <laughs> Neither of us said Dunstan checks in was amazing, just that it was a fun movie, which it is. It was amazingly fun. And so was this, to be fair. This had its moments. It has yeah. its sweetness. It has its wholesomeness. The kids are great in this, by the way. Yeah. I don't know. Like, a lot of... Um, I don't want to sound cheesy, but I think a, there's a lot more magic in the early ones. Uh, well, that reads like a film review. Like, there's a lot of magic in here. Yeah. Um. Well, is this not a film review? <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean? You know, like how the ones that you have on the front of the DVD, yeah. you know, terrific, five stars, like, the times, you know. Because as we're discovering the world with Harry, everything is yes. all special and all exciting. And then as it goes on, that just gets replaced with neon gunplay and, you know, yeah. the the shifting staircases don't seem to stick around. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Mind you, even in this film, they're only there when it's convenient for the plot to happen. That's true. I mean, it goes a bit Tim Burton-ish, like, halfway through the series. Yeah. You know, because you've even got Bellatrix and Strange, you know. Yeah, um, that's a point. Well, you've already got Alan Rickman, to be fair. <laughs> oh, this movie made me miss him, because he still looks relatively young there, and it's just like, ah, yeah. oh, this was him in his prime. You know, he, he he's, he's our guy, you know. Yeah. I mean, Snape as a character, I yeah, absolutely, fuck Snape. I fuck abjectly Snape. despise. <laughs> but, Do you know what though? He's a lot better in this movie than I remember him being because he yeah. wasn't really that nasty to anybody in this movie. I mean, he bullied Harry like the first time we saw him, but other than that scene, yeah, like, and he he I'm, picks on him for taking notes of everything he's been saying, isn't that? Yeah, while accusing him of. He accuses him of not paying attention while he's taking notes of what he's saying. He's being a model student there, and you've just got Snape not appreciating that. Yeah, or like finding any excuse he can to pick on Harry because he's Harry, as we later find yeah. out he was doing. I mean, you know, Harry shows humility in that scene. You know, there's no reason why he should be picked on by anyone, especially not Snape. We don't see enough of Snape <sighs> being shifty in this, to be honest. They just sort of assume that he's bad. Based on him being yeah. not very nice to Harry. Well, there's a few coincidences that lead them to, like, like the spell with the broom. Well, yeah, but you've got, they sort of miss out the bits which were, you know, in the book where they began to become suspicious of him. Because, you know, they, the first time they're really suspicious of Snape is when they see him chanting in the middle of the Squidditch match. Yeah. And then, um, well, just by luck. Uh, the commotion happens to break Quirrell's eye contact, and um, Hermione may have accidentally got Harry killed that day if things had shaked out a little bit differently. No, or Snape, you know, going to hospital with burns on ninety five percent of his body. I mean, as as student pranks go, setting fire to your teacher's clothes is. Uh, I appreciate uh, Madame Hooch in this, you know, from my family. Yeah. Why is Madame Hooch the only teacher at Hogwarts that isn't called Professor? I have a theory that um, she does have a Professor name, but they call her Madame Hooch because they all saw her drinking once and the nickname just sort of stuck. She's got an alcohol problem. <laughs> well, it might not even be a problem. She might just have been spotted drinking once, like Diane Abbott on that train one oh, time. Oh, that was the most petty thing. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Madame Hooch can have all the mojitos she wants. <laughs> I like the idea that, that Dumbledore and all the other teachers agree to ostracise her. Is, is that a reference that people on YouTube are going to get? British people. Yeah. You know, uh, no one else gives a shit. Yeah. Politician in England. Uh, it well, was a big story that she drank a mojito on a train once. Yeah, well, it wasn't really a big story. It was one of those things that newspapers thought people would care about more than they actually did. I think it's fair to say. I mean, it stayed in the news for like a week, then everyone forgot about it. 
Imagine that staying in the news for a week, though. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was a massive, um, uh, you know, detour. Um, yeah, to explain the reference I made. I don't think you even needed to explain it. I think most people would have been happy carrying on with a review. Yeah. Um, I sh- I'll probably need to um, use more global references. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Donald Trump, what's he all about? But anyway, yeah. Uh, did you like it? Yes, we did, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, it, it's um, it's still a good film. Very enjoyable atmosphere. Um, although the, the score gets a bit Star Wars prequels at times, doesn't it? Yes, the score is basically just um, uh, Home Alone 2 Attack of the Clones. Yeah. And then when he's in the restricted section, it is the scene with Boss Nass in Otagunga. Yeah, and I do know for a fact that they lifted the um, chase scene in the second movie where, you know, Malfoy and Harry are chasing after the snitch from the chase scene from Attack of the Clones where they're going after Sam Wessel yeah. in Coruscant. So, but do you know what? It's, you know, one of the greatest, most prolific uh, musicians in film of all time, John Williams working on two movie series, two huge movie series simultaneously. I can't blame him for work duplication. Everything sounds like everything. Even the Harry Potter theme sounds like a sped-up version of Schindler's List. So, (laughs) you know, we can give him some slack for that, for reusing Home Alone 2 beats. Because, you know, they're both kids' movies. They're both whimsical. They're both very Christmassy. They're both quite majestic in their scope in different ways. You keep making magic for as long as John Williams has, you're bound to reuse some material. Oh, yes, yeah. But Hollywood's going to keep that man on life support for, like, centuries, you know, to get the music (laughs) out of him. Well, they're probably going to try and download his brain to a robot. I can see it happening. You know, they're going to do the Walt Disney thing on him, aren't they? Cryogenically freeze him until a time when science can make him immortal. It's going to happen. John Williams bot. And you've got the up and comings, like you've got uh, Michael Graccino, uh, you know, f- who did the Lost soundtrack, he did the Rogue One soundtrack. You've got some great movie scorers out there. We're not, I'm not mean about this. I've actually preferred John Williams to Danny Elfman. In other news, water, I find water to be quite wet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, Danny Elfman has his roles, you know, he does all his. Um, Bum 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 stuff in you know the um, Tim Burton movies. He's pretty good for Batman, to be fair. You know Simpsons, but other than that, just let John Williams do it all. Sorry, that was a tangent. <laughs> it was a bit of one, but it's fine. The cinematography is really good. Yes, like this I, stands I... up well. I mean, to be honest, a lot of the scenes in this look better than scenes in the later movies. I was expecting to be disappointed with the child actors because child actors, yeah. and I wasn't. They're all perfect. I think they're all untested at this point as well. Like, I think this was their debut roles for most of them. Yeah, I think it was for Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah. Wasn't it? I mean, other than the Harry Potter movies, the only other thing I remember Rupert Grinton, and that was a couple of years later, was that Thunderpants movie. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. I saw it on TV once. That was the strangest thing. It was quite popular at the time because, you know, like, boys just like crude stuff like that. It's basically, it's about this boy who farts a lot, so some scientists invent some underwear that can transform his farts into propulsion, and he basically becomes the rocketeer, but with farts. Yeah, I think Rupert Grint being in it was what they were marketing that film on, because... Even in the trailer, they said Rupert Grint from Harry Potter. Yes, they know that's why people, you know, recognise him. They yeah. attach his ass to a space shuttle. They attach Rupert Grint's ass to a space shuttle. Not Rupert Grint's. Yeah, Rupert he, Grint's. He's not he's the lead. Fart. Is he not? No, he's just the science kid that you know utilizes the farts. So, so he invents the fart machine. Yeah, basically. Who's the kid with the farts? I can't remember. (laughs) Was the kid with the farts anybody? I don't know. (laughs) Tell us in the comments if you know. In the comments, please. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) Okay, so question number two. How well did the film accomplish its goals, and what were they? Fairly well. um, To adapt Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the book to screen. I would say, yeah, it's a pretty decent adaptation. I don't think anything that was cut out really needed to be in there. 
Uh, it was easy to adapt the Harry Potter books back then because they weren't tomes yet. I mean, in the great scheme of things, they never were, but, you know. Philosopher's Stone is, what, 230 pages? Yeah, you can get that through that in a day. Yeah, it brought that story to life and did so very well. Uh, oh, um, I want to talk about that scene in the forest, the one really creepy one. Oh my god, yes. That was such a good scene. That was the only scene that freaked me out as a child. Yeah. Because people were like, oh, isn't Voldemort scary? And I was like, no, he's just like an ugly schmuck on the back of the head. He's not scary. But that scene, bloody hell, that was frightening as a kid. Yeah, he's scarier when you don't see him. <laughs> yeah, the less you see a Voldemort, the scarier a presence he is. I love how they never show him in that flashback scene where Hagrid's telling the story, and you never see his face until the end, and then when you see his face, he just stops being scary, to be honest with you. It, it, it is a bit deflating. Suspense is scarier than shock, Yeah, it's I think. It, exactly, it's scarier than shock. I mean, in the book, you can get across the shock with the description and the power of your prose. You can't really do that with a film. It's just slightly dated CGI like, on the back of a head. If it was a practical effect, they might have pulled it off. I mean, like, just as an example, what's a film that was really um, jump scary and shock horror? Ooh, like, uh, I'm just trying to think of a few. Uh, Blair Witch? I haven't seen Blair Witch, oh, but I'm good. pretty you sure... watch it. It's fucking frightening. I'm pretty sure The Shining is scarier, and yes. very little shocking happens in that. In fairness, Ollie, I don't think this was meant to be a horror movie. No, I, I don't think it was. <laughs> but I'm just trying to drive home the point that I think that suspense is a far more effective uh, tool for evoking fear than a momentary shock is. I remember when the Forbidden Forest meant something. Like, if you went into the Forbidden Forest in Harry Potter, serious shit was about to go down. You know, big things were about to happen. I mean, like, back from the fourth or fifth one onwards, it was just, oh, let's just go into the Forbidden Forest. There's something there we need to get. And that, it just stopped being scary. Yeah. To make a lot of money and to adapt Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone to life, I believe it did both rather well. <laughs> Me too. I mean, yeah. I, ha we're, we're British and Harry Potter, I don't know if it was the same thing internationally at the time. The book series was big, like... Oh, it was huge. Like... I mean, People were anticipating the movies, and that's very rare, even of, you know, like, movie adaptations. I wasn't a big reader, but um, a teacher was reading it to me in school, and I found a copy of it in the wardrobe of my bedroom at the time. Oh, like the way you make it sound like contraband. I mean, it, it was my brother's copy. I had no idea that what, what it was when I, I knew he had it. Yeah, you were using it as a back scratcher. I don't even know how it ended up in my wardrobe. I just, like... I f <laughs> he was hiding his Harry Potter contraband because, you know, the, your parents thought it was witchcraft. Yeah, but it um it ended up there and I read the end of it because... <laughs> you brat! Because, well, no, um, it was being read to the class in school. Oh, so you wanted to get a one-up on everyone else. We'd got to the bit where they decided to go, um, you know, when they decided to go to get the stone or to confront Snape, you know, at the end. Mm. And they just got past Fluffy or something. And, um, no, wait, no, they were about to leave for that part. So I read on from that point on because that was where I'd got to at school. Yeah. I didn't just read the end to see what happens and spoil it for people. Although there were definitely people at my school that did that. I, I remember people would read the new Harry Potter book the day it came out to prevent that from happening. Yeah. You know, like, people would queue up at midnight and get these books. Is there a book series like that today? I mean, I could see people doing that for the next Game of Thrones book, but I can't really think of many other book series that could garner that much of a reaction from the general public. I don't think The Winds of Winter is going to have that kind of reaction, because we already know how everything ends up. Yeah, but, you know, he's the author. He has the power to just ignore it. But there's, there's a lot of uh, things I think it accomplished well. It grew Harry Potter into a big international media franchise. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it was bad, then the whole thing might have petered out. You never know. I'm not saying that the book franchise's success would have been contingent on the movies being a successful series. 
But I do think that it's what gave it that longevity that allowed it to spawn the spin-offs, you know, like Fantastic Beasts. You know, I first learned that the film was happening on a Coke bottle. <laughs> oh, like, I, lo- I loved it when advertising was so rampant you could learn things from food. Yeah, and that, and this was only like a week or two before it came out. <laughs> like, Doritos told me about The Phantom Menace. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of other things. Oh, oh, here's a bad one, Ollie. Uh, Lord of Rings movies. Uh, I watched the first I saw of Lord of Rings was Fellowship of the Ring. You know, as is standard. But this was at school. They only had time choice for first half, so it got to the part where the Balrog grabs Gandalf and pulls him down. Yeah. And he's falling. So I assumed that Gandalf was you know dead and buried as he sort of would. And then. Yeah. I didn't have a chance to watch The Twin Towers, and I... The Two Towers? The Two Towers. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Sorry, Ollie. Um, yeah, and then, uh, oh, Return of the King. Return of the King was coming out, and I found out from the Pringles packet that Gandalf survived. Ah. Pringles spoiled Lord of the Rings for me. Damn you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that'll be a good anecdote to tell again in the uh, inevitable... With your stupid Joseph Stalin moustache and your... Stupid quiff. So, yeah, big success. Um, would you say that the movie exceeded your expectations, Ollie? Well, no. Um, because <laughs> I had read the book and knew what to expect and pretty much got that. But, um... Today? Today, well, that would have exceeded my expectations, yes. Because adaptations are often very bad and I didn't know that at the time. Uh, yeah. But, um, today... Yeah, it's um yeah, it's good. It's I expected it to be not as good as I remembered it, and it was about as good as I remembered it. Yeah, it was a lot more atmospheric than I remember it being, and I appreciated that. Yeah. Uh, I appreciated the Forbidden Forest scenes, I think they're the best. Also, I think that the Forbidden Forest scene is the one and only time uh, although you can count the flashback scene where Hagrid's telling about how he tried to kill his... Pa- well, how he killed his parents. That is Voldemort. Yeah. Yeah, that scene and the scene in the Forbidden Forest where the hooded Voldemort is drinking from the unicorn's blood. Those are the only two scenes in all of Harry Potter for me where Voldemort was even the least bit scary and intimidating. Yeah, I, I would... Uh, I'd be inclined to agree. I found... Um, He's creepy in the second one, which is the intention. He's a lot younger, and there's sort of the, you know, like, the children from The Simpsons vibe. Ah, uh, yeah, we know all your secrets. That's what that Voldemort reminds me <laughs> of, you know, the Tom Riddle yeah. in the second one. He was creepy. He wasn't frightening, though. And, well, let's face it, Ralph Fiennes, perfectly good actor, amazing, one of the best villains on screen ever, Amon Goff in Schindler's List. You know, like, one of the best villainous on-screen roles of all time. They get him to play Voldemort, brilliant on paper. He's just goofy for, like, six movies. (laughs) Well, four movies, five, I don't know, five movies. He's goofy for five movies. Like, he has all these weird sort of... Well, it it wasn't Ray Fiennes yet. Well, no, no, it wasn't, but... As soon as they get him for Goblet of Fire, on paper, he's the perfect person for Voldemort. He looks for role, he can play an, a brilliant, evil character. But he's just like a cartoonishly goofy character a lot of the time. Like his silly laugh. <laughs> Def- yeah, his silly laugh in the last definitely hallows. The way he's just like, oh, I can touch you now. You know, uh, it, it's just... He's a pantomime villain. Yeah, he's a pantomime villain. He's up to the camp. I think they realised at some point that there's no way with today's technology, well, the technology of, like, 2004, that they can make him scary, so they shouldn't even try, they should just up the camp. You know, make him, like, Palpatine. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) true. I get why they did it, but it's kind of disappointing that we never got a terrifying Voldemort, except for one scene in the first one. Well, you don't want to alienate the kids too much, either, in this... um ostensibly children's franchise. I don't even know why I said ostensibly there. It is a children's franchise. Well, you know, tell that to all the grown-ups who attend the midnight screenings and ship all the characters and write the fan fiction. 
I'm sure they know it's intended for children. It doesn't mean they can't enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. That's the mature way of looking at this. Yeah, yeah the movie slightly exceeded my expectations because there were a few things I appreciated about it that I'd totally forgotten through not watching it in a long time. Yeah. The acting is top-notch. You're right, the child actors in this are excellent. Daniel Radcliffe is really good in this one. Yeah, I was It's just surprised. his facial expressions. It's not even so much when he's speaking, it's his facial expressions. Like, you know, the dirty look that he gives, um, <laughs> you know, uh, Vernon. The side-eye. Yeah, the side-eye he gives Vernon. The how angry he looks at um, Dudley when he removes the glass. Which I don't think that power ever comes up again in Harry Potter. No. You know, which is fine, because it's a slight introduction to the magic world, but it's just weird that that never comes up again. I mean, well, it does come up again in uh, Prisoner of Azkaban when he inflates his aunt. What? Whole losing control of your magic thing does come up again. Oh. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, everybody is just gold. You know, the actors in this are fantastic. They've got some of the best actors. They've got, um... Uh, you know, Dumbledore, Harris. Richard Harris was a perfect Yeah, Richard Dumbledore. Harris was very good. And, well, obviously we understand why he had to be recast. I mean... Busy schedule. <laughs> you can't plan for death. But I I really wish Richard Harris had been able to be Dumbledore throughout the whole series, because he was perfect. Me too. Which is not saying anything against Michael Gambon, but Richard Harris was perfect. Yeah, Richard Harris was just Dumbledore as I pictured him in the books. Because I read the book shortly before seeing the movie in preparation. Yeah. And he is exactly what I pictured. Uh, I'd not seen any of the trailers, so I didn't go in knowing what everyone would look like. Just, he gives off Dumbledore, you know, he's got the gentleness, the kindness, the aloof, you know, mystery, <laughs> not wanting to reveal too much to anybody. Even years after he was recast, whenever I read a new Harry Potter book, um... I would read Dumbledore in Richard Harris's voice in my head. Me too. I mean, nothing against Michael Gambon. He's a fantastic actor in a lot of things. I just feel like he was wrong for the role of Dumbledore, to be honest. Not necessarily wrong, just wrong for Dumbledore of that age. I could picture him as a younger, more headstrong, more bullshy Dumbledore. But maybe it's just the way he's cast, uh, not cast, and um, directed in those movies. Uh, maybe it's just because we're comparing him to Richard Harris. Yeah, it's unfair to do so. I, again, I think he played a very serviceable Dumbledore. He was good at times. I, I liked him. He was great during the fight scenes, actually. And I, I do yeah. worry about how um, Richard Harris would have ma managed to do the um, more practical stuff later on in the series, like when he's fighting Voldemort, when he's entering the cave to find the Horcrux... I'm sure there would have been ways to uh, allow him to do that. Yeah, I mean, Michael Gambon is the better action-packed Dumbledore, and uh, Richard Harris is just Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah. and Well, there was a picture of Dumbledore on the back of the book, so I, I think everyone had an image of what Dumbledore was supposed to look like. They do nail that look! But do you yeah. remember from the, from the book, there was another character who I couldn't really decipher who it was meant to be. I think it was meant to be Quirrell. That was the one with the brown hair. Yeah, I think it was meant... To, um, we're not talking about Harry Potter here. We're talking about on the back of a book. I think it was meant to be Quirrell, but he looked nothing like Quirrell. He wasn't wearing a turban. but I don't know who the hell it was meant to be. I'm going to try and find uh, this. I always assumed it was meant to be a younger Dumbledore. <laughs> I mean, we could be going on very early prints in the UK, which will be completely... Unknown for the international audience. Yeah. What question are we currently trying to answer? Um, did the movie exceed our expectations? And <laughs> I think we answered it, so we may as well move on to question four. Yeah. Is there an element in this film that specifically appeals to you? Um, when I wanted to see it as a kid, the element that appeals to me was it was a book I very much enjoyed, but in a visual medium. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um... We've already established it nailed that. I was already a fan before the film came out. Uh, but is there an element in the film that specifically appeals to me? I would say it's probably the soundtrack. And yes. The, um, well, the general aesthetic is just... 
there's a lot of care obviously gone into that. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, even though I spent five minutes ragging on the soundtrack, basically being a copy and paste from other John Williams movies, it's just still amazing. It really yeah, is. It it really works, and the atmosphere in general uh, always feels the way I imagine it's supposed to. If that makes sense. Uh, yes. Nothing feels out of place. Um, Without being cheesy, it, it's a great world. It's a great world to uh, um, be in for a little bit. Yeah. And, well, I always liked the world of Harry Potter more than anything that happened in it, to be honest. I agree. I like the world of Harry Potter better than I like any of the characters, all the stories, all the lore even, even though there's some pretty good lore in it, I must say. Apart from Neville and Luna, like, you know, they're good. Yeah, yeah, Neville got robbed. He he should have had a greater part of significance. I mean, I know that he was kind of integral to defeating Voldemort in the end, but yeah. I wanted to see more of him, at least in the movies, at the very least. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Neville is the hero we can relate to. I was apparently very forgetful as a child. You've probably heard me fumble on people's names loads in these shows, so, you know. The fact that there's a likeable lump of a character who forgets things and means no harm to anyone sort of makes me feel, you know, not so alone. <laughs> I could never relate to Harry. I always thought, oh my god, he's too brash. He's doing all these dumb things. He's getting angry all the time. I found it hard to relate to Harry. Like, when the plot only works because your characters suddenly become idiots for five minutes, your plot doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ron was too small-minded at times for me to relate to. Uh, Hermione was too much of a show-off for me to really relate to. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that default leaves me as a Neville Longbottom kid. The little window into that world that this film specifically gives you, because it's the introduction to it, is uh, probably the thing that really appeals to me. And, well... The camera work, the soundtrack, the you know the t- tone visually where appropriate, it can go from vibrant colours, and then a few scenes later have the forbidden forest scene. Oh and yeah, it all just works. I don't know how they filmed atmosphere. I guess would be the element. <laughs> I don't know if they filmed the forbidden forest in an actual forest. Uh, I suppose they probably would have used, you know, trickery to do that in a studio in order to get the mist perfect. But that looks so good because it looks like a forbidden forest. You can't see what's going on. There's a bit where you see a glimpse of, like, Voldemort in a hood just walking past. It just feels... I mean, I was scared shitless as a kid. And nothing else in this movie did. Everyone was like, oh, that scene where his face falls apart is so scary. And I was like... No, it wasn't. It wasn't. That was probably the least scary part of that That was tacky CGI. And Voldemort is such an incompetent villain because, you know, he sees that um, Quirrell's hand got dissolved just by touching Harry. So what does he do? Jump on Harry! You know, that can't end badly. Did he see that, though? He wasn't exactly looking. (laughs) Yeah, but he shares a body with him. He must have felt like the hand dissolved. Uh, yeah, but we don't really know the logistics of that, do we? Like, does he feel what Quirrell feels? Does he know what he knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, um, how would sex work for Quirrell? I knew you were going to take it there. I, I, yes. I... <laughs> but picture it, you know, um, the, the head I'd teachers... I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> the head teachers are having a night out. You know, they deserve it. They work hard. They're unwinding. They're going to a good old nightclub in London. One of those super clubs. You know, they got in because, you know, uh, Hagrid knows a bloke at the door. Uh, you know, um, uh, Quirrell sees this girl, you know, like, dancing on the floor, giving him the eye, the eye, and uh, he's like, oh, I'm in here. So uh, they get dancing, you know, they've had a few drinks. Uh, you know, they get back to the hotel room, you know, uh, it's, it's like, oh, take it all off. Like, no, the turban stays on. It's like, oh, kinky, okay. And uh, I am a Sikh. I am forbidden to bear my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's sex going on now, you know, like, Quirrell's getting in there, and then all of a sudden, you hear a loud moaning from behind the turban. And she's like, what was that? Oh, nothing, nothing, ignore that. And they continue, and loud moaning again. <laughs> then you just hear Bob Walk going, oh, I'm gonna come. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is what happens. There must have been scenes where Voldemort was tempted to chime in, like, I don't know, um... 
This uh, is ostensibly an analysis channel. <laughs> sorry about <laughs> this, guys. <laughs> no, you're not. No, I'm not. Could yeah. you drown him in the bath? Like, by yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> like, lift your head, I can't breathe. <laughs> but if I were Voldemort, I'd be tempted to chime in, like, um, if Quirrell's doing a lesson and it's like, the yellow spotted dragon was first discovered in 1937. 1939! What was that? <laughs> Oh, 1939. 1939. Or, like, I don't know, if he just did smacked up some chalk from the chalkboard and then Voldemort just sneezes under the turban. (laughs) 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 (sighs) I don't think we're expected to think about the everyday logistics of having a face in the back of your head. Yeah. So, like, what would happen if Quirrell got laid? (laughs) Somehow I don't think you'd need to worry about that. Oh, come on, he's a good-looking bloke. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, wizards don't go clubbing. Like, so that puts that part of your analogy. They the epic ones know... do. The epic ones do, Ollie. They probably don't know what a nightclub is. <laughs> like, well, we don't know what wizards do or don't know about the Muggle world. I mean, let's face it. Um, a party to these people is singing a song, you know, move your body like a hairy troll. This is a party to those people. They don't know fun if it would hit them smack in the face. <laughs> Which is weird because they uh, have magic and... um a sport which involves flying and balls that could knock you off brooms and kill you. Oh, bloody hell, did Quirrell have balls that could knock you off brooms? You know, with his audacious plans. (laughs) 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 So yeah, the element in this film that specifically appealed to me would be the atmosphere, just like Ollie. It feels Harry Potter in a way that a lot of the later ones don't really, to the same extent. Well, there's a real sense of whimsy here, which in the later films just gets uh, shoved aside, really, for the sake of plot progression. I mean, you could argue the same about the books, you know, as the books grew progressively darker and as the kids began to grow up, you know, a lot of the whimsy was lost, but that's natural, you know, it's just the world getting darker, the story becoming more high stakes... You know, these things being less impressive to the kids as they get older. Yeah, I suppose. But, you know, you'll never be able to take away the magic of, like, the first two Harry Potter movies. Again, no pun intended. I feel like we're making some kind of cheesy pun every time we use the word magic, but that's what it is. We're talking about the future films more than this one, but I really like how in the earlier films... Well, in the earlier films, they keep from the books the... uh, you know, using specific spells in specific encounters, whereas later it's just, like, um, neon gunplay with wands. Yeah, and I feel like that was lost, because, you know, it, the wizard battles become less a battle of wits and more, you know, Kamehameha's, and, well, you know, which is okay, but it's not quite the same as, you know, using a specific spell in a specific situation, like yeah. what Hermione often did in the earlier ones. Yeah. Um, the spell that she used against the Devil's Snare would actually be really useful in a confrontation. That should have been a standard spell, you know, like the Solar Flare. Yeah, blind your opponent. Yeah, I mean, if if it's if, if it's helpful in Dragon Ball Z, it would be helpful in Harry Potter. Could Pop also too. be used as a distress signal, like just point it off. Yeah, I mean, they kind of have that flare power that they used in the the maze in the fourth film. Yeah. So they sort of have that already, but maybe that is that spell, I don't know. So how does this film stack up today, Ollie? I think it holds up well. Um, Some of the CGI in tiny places looks a bit dated, but um, generally it's a very well-made film. I mean, it's Christmas Day, you're picking out movies, you know, you pick Babe, you pick Philosopher's Stone... These are the kinds of movies you want to watch with your family on Christmas Day. Well, yeah. I I don't know about this. Like, I probably wouldn't pick out the Blu-ray I used to watch this uh, if we weren't doing it for a YouTube channel, just because I'm really disenfranchised with Harry Potter right now. (laughs) Can't blame you. I mean, I guess it's hard to separate the artist from the art. Yeah. uh, 
but I did enjoy this film and it was nice to be able to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. there's too many people involved in Harry Potter for it to be all about one person who's distasteful. Yeah. You know, there's too many talented people who gave so much to these movies to not acknowledge them, really. Absolutely. But it's, it's just small things like the invisibility cloak music and how ominous and mysterious it is. I don't know how important the invisibility cloak was at this point. You know, like, whether or not JK just retconned in that it was the um, Deathly Hallow later on, or whether it was planned from the beginning. It's like Lost, we'll never know the full extent. To begin with, I would have believed either, but now I think it was probably definitely a retcon. Yeah, because it doesn't feel like it's built up to be as important as it is later. Although, it's just the music is so good for the invisibility cog. It feels so good when he's sneaking around the library. Oh yeah. my god, that is so excellent. <laughs> the book with the face freaked me out as well. That was one of two things in that movie that freaked me out as a yeah. kid. Th- there are things like that in Harry Potter that happen once and then never again. And, well, the book with the face in it, what was that? We never found out. Why would anybody make that? <laughs> yeah, You're not going to be able to peacefully read that thing. It's basically a gimmick I mean- that... Is that an anti-theft measure or something? Uh, I choose to believe it was some sort of anti-theft measure. And, like, it was set to scream if a student tried to open it at night or something. It's it's like those talking cookie jars. You know, you're only going to, you know, keep it around for a week for the novelty. It's not going to become an item of utility. Yeah. You know, like ones that are like, stop, move away from the cookie jar. Those kinds of things. Yeah. No, uh, it's like the Billy Bass on the wall. Who is has that like for an extended period of time? You know, like, how you know how many times are you going to invite your friends around, pressing like, oh, isn't that amazing? You know, how it sings the soul. The novelty will wear off after a week. Yeah, but yeah, there's another funny thing that I didn't realise when I read the books was the centaurs. You know, like Ferenz, I think is the name of one we meet in this one. Uh, I. Didn't re- I wasn't really that familiar with the concept of a centaur as like a nine year old, so I thought that it was going to be a horse with a human head. I didn't think there was going to be a torso and arms involved. I just imagined like a pony with the head of a human, <laughs> which is somehow a lot less impressive. But that's what I imagined. Are centaurs technically insects? Because six <laughs> yes, legs. yeah, they are, and they've got a bit of an abdomen going on, haven't they? So yeah, they're insects. The chess scene montage, which I think is the only montage in this movie, was good. Yeah. Um, Those chess pieces look badass. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, (laughs) I mean, (laughs) uh, I I, I just love that scene. I like the three challenges they go through, because, you know, you've got the one that Hermione is good at, you know, which is knowing the spell. You've got the one which Harry's good at, because he knows how to fly a broom well. And you've got the one that Ron's good at, because he's good at chess. Yeah. One scene that was kind of pointless in this movie was the scene where uh, McGonagall sitting on the desk as a cat and then surprises them. Uh, you know, I saying, oh, you're late. That feels like a deleted scene that got kept in. It doesn't really serve any purpose to the plot. Yeah, and right after it, we go s- straight to Snape's class. We see nothing of that lesson. Uh, <laughs> like, we wouldn't even know from the uh, um, scene that we got without already knowing from the book that she teaches Transfiguration. I'm going to um, actually uh, stick up for Snape for maybe the first and only time. Uh, that opening speech that he did to the students was actually really good. You know, as a 10-year-old kid, that would have impressed me. Uh, but yeah, he does a really good job of selling why the why potions is such an impressive sort of art. Yeah, he does. He sells the hell out of it. You know, if you pay attention, I can make you powerful and extraordinary. I, I just love that. That that would have really sold me on the subject. I probably would have liked Snape until he was um, uh, unwarrantedly nasty to Harry for absolutely no reason. Yeah, we don't see any of the uh, lesson in McGonagall's class. Like, from the context, we know that she can turn into animals, but we don't know what she teaches. And um, I feel like they just filmed it, thought, that's neat, let's keep it in. I want to talk about how Harry actually 
influences the course of events very little, and in fact arguably makes things worse by being there. We kind of realised this at the end of the movie, didn't we? Yeah, because like, if Harry doesn't confront Quirrell at the mirror, how does he get the stone? Yeah, because, you know, at first I thought they were being really lax about all the defences, because they're all stuff that's easy to get past. You know, for an adult anyway. Uh, you know, an adult with magical skill. But Dumbledore says that only like one with the pure of heart can get the stone or whatever. I don't remember. No, he specifically says only someone who wants to find the stone but not to use it can get it. Yeah, so basically he was just trolling Voldemort. (laughs) So basically the stone was perfectly safe from Voldemort. I mean, he might have broken the mirror in frustration and then what? I don't know, Um, but yeah, Quirrell would have just been standing there like a dumbass until somebody turned up and arrested him. I mean, I mean, Harry being of noble intent is all well and good, but if he hadn't showed up and got the stone out of the mirror, it would have been safe. Yeah, Harry just gives Voldemort a chance. (laughs) Yeah. It's one of those Raiders of the Lost Ark situations where the character's presence in the story doesn't change things at all, except for the worse. You're kind of right, although actually, yeah, I would say that um, Indiana Jones does change things in Raiders, because, you know, if the uh, Nazis had used the thing on the island, like they did, more Nazis would have just came to pick it up later anyway. Yeah, I suppose. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, um, at least Indiana Jones could get it off the island, you know, through being there. Yeah. How did he shift that? Like, did him and Marion just sort of carry it off the island themselves, or did he call for help? Or No, they they, uh, they chuckle-brothered it. <laughs> to meet you. He was very lucky that there were no other Nazis on that Nazi base, other than <laughs> the ones that were present there. <laughs> they put all their eggs in one basket. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Indiana Jones falls into our um, jurisdiction, does it? Well, one kind of does, but we're not going to talk about that, are we? Oh, yeah. Actually, Young Indiana Jones Chronicles could be something we talk about. I think that was from the early 90s. I haven't seen it. I watched one episode. That was one where Otto von Vorbeck, I believe, um, meets Indiana Jones initially you know, as an antagonist, and then they sort of be- uh, become friends begrudgingly. He was the... Um, German general in the First World War who commanded the colonial forces in Africa and basically made a monkey out of the um, you know British forces through the whole war by fighting a um, guerrilla war uh, on basically nothing in the jungle for four years. But that's a, that's completely beyond the scope of this channel. Yep. Sorry, we go on so many tangents. You go on so many tangents. I don't act like you don't enjoy it. <laughs> oh. The film does stack up well today. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. And the f- okay, number six. Was the film received appropriately at the time? I think so, yes. It was a huge hit. In fact, if anything, I think it was a little bit over-egged. Well... It's because the book was already massive. This film was guaranteed to succeed. And um, I'm glad that they had the faith to put the budget in that they did, because uh, I I don't think I've seen an adaptation of a book series with that kind of faith in it through, you know, how much money they threw at it, at least until Hunger Games. And even then, the first one of those was a bit... Yeah, the first one did the whole shaky cam thing. That was already a tired trope at the time, and I'm glad they did away with it for the later ones, or at least removed the worst um, excesses. My my point is, the first Hunger Games looks pretty low budget, and I think a lot of adaptations sort of are. I mean, I don't want to talk more about the Percy Jackson movies than I have to. Well, they looked kind of cheap. And yeah. That if there's one thing this film doesn't look, it's cheap. Oh no, I mean, the budget. I'm going to look up the budget of this, actually. Yeah. Well, if you've got Warner Brothers money. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You've, you've got the rabbit behind you. Okay, let's find out. Um, this movie, a 2001 movie, It, met, it the budget was £125 million. 
That is impressive. I think that's the biggest budget so far that we've... Uh... Yeah, it is an extra fifth of what um, Bicentennial Man had. Where did all that money go? I don't know. In just Bicentennial like... Man. <laughs> well, you know, you needed Robin Williams' face prosthetics, didn't you? I don't think it comes to a hundred million. Anyway, no. So you, are you accusing this that movie of being a money laundering scheme? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't. <laughs> We've got to f- find out how deep rabbit hole goes on. <laughs> oh God, have we stumbled onto something? Uh, FBI, open up. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, um, do you know how much this made at the box office? How much? Get brace yourself, Ollie. Yeah. Are you sufficiently braced? I am sufficiently braced. 978.1 million. Jesus. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, it was crowded in the cinema. We've already talked about this. There wasn't a seat empty. You had to reserve tickets weeks in advance to have a chance of seeing it in, like, the first week. And that's the last time I remember that happening, ever. Like, I mean, I didn't have to queue to get in... Well... I didn't have to reserve tickets to get into Endgame. No. <laughs> like, you know, and that was a similarly huge event. Although, I did have to for Black Panther, I seem to remember. Yeah, that was a huge movie. Yeah. Rightfully so, I like it. It's okay. one of the best Marvels. So, like, this was... Well... A similar scale, because... Harry Potter... Like, between... The space of time between those two... um two movies that I remember having to reserve tickets for is vast, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the Harry Potter phenomenon would be as popular if it came out today. I don't know if it would. I mean, Harry Potter, in a lot of ways, contributed to the adaptation sort of... There's a humbleness thing. to Harry Potter, as in the franchise, you know, on a scale. You know, it's all about small families and you know, kids at school, that I don't think you'd really get in this day and age, because all the big franchises of today are big, like, um, big battles of good and evil. I know that's what Harry Potter becomes, but yeah. the scale is a lot more epic in all the modern-day franchises, like the MCU, yeah. uh, you know, Star Wars. Yeah, and this was, I won't say a grounded story, but a small personal st- sort of story. Yeah. That eventually snowballs into an epic battle. Uh, although even... Not unlike in, Hunger Games. Even then, in Harry Potter, it's a comparatively smaller scale than other franchises. Yeah, I mean, they do the whole chosen one trope. Uh, I, 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 I'm tired of it now, but, you know, it worked okay for Harry Potter because, you know, there was the whole thing like, you know, is he even the chosen one? Does he deserve to be? He's not a perfect person. He's flawed. You know, and I like that they kept that in. Yeah, I'd quite happily never see another Chosen One thing again. Yeah, it's it's lazy. Yeah, exactly. Unless it was done like Hunger Games, where the Chosen One character didn't even want to be the Chosen One, and it was definitely not the ideal person for it. No, there, there are um, ways to do it well. Like, uh, Moana, I think, was a good example of a Chosen One story. That's something I need to watch. It's like one of the few Disney movies of recent years I haven't seen yet. Oh, well, you should. Yeah. Is Dwayne Johnson in that one? He is, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. He plays a big guy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to watch that. Okay, is there anything more to say on Harry Potter? Oh, well, it's Harry Potter. Could probably like ten hours of things in there. I like how fun a villain Quirrell is. Oh, yeah. For, for and the um, Quirrell is criminally underutilized in this movie. For the scenes that he gets as a villain, or the scene that he gets as a villain, that where we know it's him. But that's the thing about the movie. I think what the book has over the movie in this instance is it doesn't give you enough clues about Quirrell. There's a lot of subtle things that if you pick up on them, you can sort of piece the pieces together that Quirrell's the bad guy in the book. You know, like things like, oh, he's standing in the corner, nervously twitching his turban. Things like that, you know, small things that you can't really get across in the film. Uh, And also, you get like three scenes of him being assumably a good guy where he doesn't really do much. Uh, The troll in the dungeon thing's always fun to watch. 
uh, and you get one scene where he's a great villain. And that, another thing about the Harry Potter movies is... Where he just sort of discards the whole stammering persona. Which I think is hilarious and just fun. It's just good. And that's the thing about Harry Potter. It's just 40 minutes of people venomously saying, Potter! Yeah, loosely connected by some plot. <laughs> Basically, you know, you've got the uncle and the aunt going, Potter, Potter, Potter. You've got, you know, um, Quirrell doing it. You've got Voldemort doing it. You've got Malfoy going... Potter, my, my my father will hear about this. He's good in this. The uh, the young Tom Felton, scared Potter. You wish. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, young. Oh, he's a good boy. Um, everyone was like, oh, he was a really cute boy. He was probably too nice, like as a person, to be Malfoy as intended. I think people expected him to have a redemption arc. I don't know. He sold the hell out of it. Oh, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I mean, I think that making him more sympathetic in the movies than he was in the books is a good call. Like, the the Half-Blood Prince scenes where he feels remorse and upset about, you know, all the horrible things he's doing, you know, that was perfect. And I wish we got to see more of, you know, torn Malfoy. I think it's appropriate that there's there's a lot more whimsy in the early films because we are seeing it through the eyes of a child. Yeah, the movies and the books grow up with their target audience, which is perfect. Yeah, I was just the right age for Harry Potter, I guess. So, yeah. Um, when Ron says every there isn't a witch or wizard that went bad that wasn't in Slytherin, we're just kind of expected to accept that. Like, th- there wasn't one Gryffindor who did the wrong things convinced he was doing the right thing. You know, thing. of course a Gryffindor would say that. You know, not one Gryffindor too headstrong for his own. Yeah. Uh, not one Hufflepuff disgruntled at being part of the rest. I mean, it's just J.K. being J.K., but you know, there's not enough nuance in Harry Potter. <laughs> you know, you've got the Gryffindors, despite being very brash and having not one, not one Ravenclaw that got was overcome. No, by no, Quirrell, Quirrell, he was a Ravenclaw, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, was I it? think so. Yeah, but he was sort of possessed, though. It's sort of ambiguous as to how much of it was his idea and how much of it was, you know, like being influenced by the Dark Lord. I think there's sort of a halfway thing where he did want more power. He was fed up of not being acknowledged and being made fun of. Um, but he didn't sign up for, you know, like his face getting dissolved by a small child. Yeah, Harry committed murder. He did, and we all love him for it. <laughs> he was killing people as a baby, technically. Well, Bad people didn't technically die. I like how it's a subversion of the whole "would you kill baby Hitler" thing. The real question is, would the baby kill Hitler? <laughs> <laughs> In Soviet Union, baby kills Hitler. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear! True. I love it. Uh, oh, but yeah, I wish we got more Quirrell scenes in this movie because one thing that the movies do quite well is establishing the defence against the dark arts teacher character because you get a new one in every movie because of the whole curse on the role and I love how people still take up the role knowing this I I wonder what the pay is for a defence against the dark arts teacher it probably gets more expensive every year yeah it must be like um, you know there's this job that's come up it's a really good one really well paid except there's a curse everybody who does it, either ends up dead or horribly disfigured or life-alteringly injured in some way. Hold my Nobody beer! Nothing lasts more than a year is the uh, the clincher. Hold my butter beer. Remus <laughs> <laughs> uh, was the only one I liked. Defense against <laughs> the dark arts teachers. The yeah. others are fun to watch, though, for different reasons. He's also the only one that left voluntarily. Yeah! Yeah, which is cool. He sort of, you know, got the writing on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like you were saying, I wish we got to see more bad Gryffindors and more good Slytherins. Because those characteristics don't necessarily make you a bad person unless you let them. Yeah. I mean, you get one good Slytherin, you know, you've got Slughorn in the last couple of books. And his only real fault seems to be that he's a bit self-centred. That's about it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, another small thing I'm going to say before we wrap this up. Uh, I liked the Flamel lore in this, you know, Nicholas Flamel. And I like how you sort of get to know his character a bit without 
even seeing him, like you see, um, you know, uh, Harry saying, well, if the stone's destroyed, then isn't he going to die? And then uh, Dumbledore's like, well, we had this conversation and he did decide it was for the best. He's setting his affairs in order. I like how you sort of get a sense of the man without ever seeing him. So they sort of decide that uh, the stone isn't a thing that should exist. Although... No shit, Sherlock! (laughs) It doesn't go into how a Philosopher's Stone is made. But I like how the Philosopher's Stone is an... Is knowledge enough for, to be written about in books in the non-forbidden section? Yet people aren't going up to Flamel and saying, "Oh, come on, tell me the secret. Come on, tell me some of this." You know, why is he keeping it to himself? It's weird how the wizards just aren't that bothered by it. I've got to look into philosopher's stone in mythology, because um, I know this is a bit of a uh, this this is a massive tangent. But in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, which I watch, yeah, there is. Um, a philosopher's stone, and they're trying to make one. But in order to make one, they basically have to murder an entire continent. Bloody hell! I mean, the um, <laughs> that's a bit. Extreme. I mean, I doubt that's how Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel did it. Well, we all know that Dumbledore's a bit shady, don't we? I don't think he's mass genocide shady, though. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> Cr- Cr- Fr- Flamel did it hundreds of years ago because what they say is like six hundred years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I like how people just aren't bothered by things in Harry Potter. Yeah. Well, um, Hello Future Me recently did a really good video on hard versus soft world building. I gotta watch that. Yeah. He says Harry Potter um, is a really good example of soft world building where you're not really expected to think about it too much. That not a lot is expected to be explained and you can just sort of sprinkle things in here and there and yeah I think that's how it works best because well JK has a habit of uh, trying to clear things up in post lately oh lately well last 10 years (laughs) (laughs) Uh... and then like I don't know pretend Nagini was always a a human that wife. is the stupidest thing ever oh my god that's so dumb so when she wrote the snake eating that woman what are the implications cannibalism there? that's the, the implications you know they're cannibals yeah okay um <laughs> yeah i mean we could do you know what we could go on about the tragic tale of J.K. Rowling's retcons forever. But yeah, well, I'll tell you what. When we do Chamber of Secrets, I promise you a lengthy discussion about the weird governing system of the Harry Potter Wizarding World. Yeah, it's so <laughs> ridiculous. It's basically um, it's... what did we call it? Libertarian authoritarianism. Well, I, I called it anarcho anarcho um, uh, authoritarianism. Anarcho totalitarianism. Yes, that's basically it. <laughs> where most things the law don't care about, except for very minor things which they just crack down on. Yeah. But yeah, that's a discussion for another day. Uh, all in all, sum up your feelings and thoughts on this movie, Ollie. Um, well, I think I have pretty much loved this video. It's a really good atmosphere for what it is. It It really gives you the feel of going to a magic world for the first time. Yeah. And how else can I say it? If there is one major triumph in this film, it is atmosphere. Yeah, I don't think that I could add anything to what you've already said. Yeah, not that there is only one major triumph. I mean, there's there's nothing too bad about this film at all. Yeah. The soundtrack, the cast, the uh, visuals, brilliant. We don't really have a scoring system, but if we did, it would score pretty high. Yeah, it'd be like 9.5 out of 9.7, something like that. Why would the scale end at 9.7? The scale ends where I say it ends! (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that, a bit scary. (laughs) Alright, we hope that you enjoyed listening to our in-depth discussion about how um, Quirrell fucks. Your in-depth diatribe of about how Quirrell fucks. <laughs> These are the subjects that need to be discussed. <laughs> We're going to see how deep this rabbit hole goes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh dear. 
Ah, oh, thank you for joining us. Uh, wait till you see what we've got in store next week. Yeah. Yeah, we will see you next week. See you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>